turned off. We're going to provide access to the chat box at the end for our Q&A portion. Um, and then just remember then just to make sure that you're being respectful. And also after our Q&A, if you want to, you can stick around um, and you can talk Verge with us. So now a little bit about our amazing speaker today. We have <laughs> Natasha Fontaine. Um, Natasha is an avian ecologist, an avid recordist, and a natural science illustrator. She studied mockingbird vocalizations at Queens College, CUNY. She moved to Florida in 2018 and completed her graduate degree in 2021. She's traveled to Costa Rica, Peru, and Ecuador. She's volunteered as a bird bander in Alabama, worked as a field technician in South Carolina, surveyed wintering grassland birds in the Southwest, and is currently a biologist for Audubon, Florida. So without further ado, Natasha, if you're ready to start sharing your screen, I'm ready for you to do that. Okay, thank you so much for that um, amazing introduction. <laughs> Let me share the screen here and let me make sure that you can hear audio. Okay. And oops. Sorry about that. That is not supposed to happen right now. <laughs> Give me one second. <laughs> that was just a little teaser. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll just close it out and so that doesn't happen again. Okay, that should not happen again. All righty. Okay, so you can see my slide, yeah? Yep. Okay, and hopefully you'll be able to hear the audio. All right, that wasn't supposed to happen. Technical <laughs> 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 difficulties, here we go, I remember back. And hopefully you'll be able to hear the audio uh, yeah. when we Okay, so thank you again for that um, amazing introduction. Um, as Blair mentioned, I'm an avian ecologist, field biologist. Um, I am not sure yet if this is an actual word, bioacoustician, <laughs> but I'm an avid recordist. <laughs> it just sounds right. Um, I'm obsessed with sounds, natural science illustrator, and um, I'm definitely a birder. <laughs> um, and that is not my dog. Um, that was a visit to an artist that um, I had the opportunity to uh, visit in El Paso, and that was his dog. So, <laughs> But he was very cute. Um, so basically how I am organized this talk is first, I'm going to give a very brief overview about uh, Wimbrel stopover ecology, the work that I did in South Carolina. Then I'm going to get into winter grassland birds in the Chihuahuan Desert in New Mexico. I'm going to talk about birding, uh, some of the birds that I have been seeing and experiences. Of course, audio is going to come with that and then some of my illustrations. So basically today's talk is gonna be just a brief overview of some of the projects that I've worked on. So starting off with, uh, let me pull this down a bit. Starting off with Wimbrels. So a few Wimbrel basics. So Wimbrel, they're a type of curlew. They are, they are a long distance migrant. Um, they uh, migrate primarily uh, coastal and they're an oceanic migrant, um, although there has been times that they will fly over, uh, migrate over land. Um, some coastal migrants undergo a nonstop Atlantic flight up to 4,000 kilometers from southern Canada um, or New England to South America. Um, so just to give you an overview from basically Canada, New England's area, all the way down South to South America. Um, coastal staging areas are most critical to migrant wimbrels, but many of them have not been identified, which makes the wimbrel project so special because they know that these uh, staging areas exist, um, but all of them, well, many of them have not been identified 
um, as the project that we're going to talk about. Um, and so they, in North America, they breed in Alaska and in Canada, up in that area. So some feeding behavior, um, feeding behavior basics. So they have a long decurved bill used for probing. They primarily eat marine invertebrates, crabs, and other crustaceans. Uh, they do a lot of probing with this long bill. They get in the soil and they're picking out those, those crabs and marine worms. Um, but on the breeding grounds, what's really interesting is that they consume insects, but they also consume a lot of berries. And I don't have the name here, but they do consume a large amount of vaccinium species, which is in a blueberry family. And the feeding behavior that they do when it comes down to probing for crustaceans is very similar when they're probing for, for berries. So these uh, vaccinium shrubs, they grow really thick and heavy. And so, you know, there will be berries on the outside, but there are also berries on the inside. So they use that bill to get into the shrub, um, which I thought was, pretty was a pretty interesting um, fact of how different their, um, their um, foraging, not foraging behavior, but their diet varies from season to season. Um, so here's an image of um, some wimbrel that I took um, out on DeVoe Bank, and I'm going to play a short clip of their one of one of their vocalization types that I was able to capture out um, on Botany Bay um, in South Carolina. <laughs> a variety of calls and some of the calls like this one is more uh on the end of like a contact call and also kind of an alarm call as well um which is very different from the call that they make when they're coming in to roost um which is more of like it's more of a song it's a more light trilly kind of not really a trill but kind of a a flowy kind of a uh, call um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a recording of that, uh, maybe next time. So um, the discovery of DeVoe was about 20,000 Wimbrel. And so I got this off of the Cornell website that quoted, this was one of the most mind-blowing discoveries in the history of 20, uh, 20th and 21st century in ornithology. Because a lot of times we think that we know everything and it's kind of daunting of like, wait, we didn't know about 20,000 birds and not, not little birds, but fairly large birds. Like, how do we not know about this? So Felicia Sanders, she's a, a seasoned biologist, shorebird and seabird project coordinator um, at the South Carolina Department of Resources. And she is the one who made this discovery. She is an amazing biologist, an amazing person, and just someone that is very inspiring to me. Um, and she made this discovery by, you know, basically being curious, you know, being at the right place during an odd time, I would have to say, because as shorebird biologists, a lot of times that we are outside during the daytime, and this wasn't the normal probably hour that most shorebird biologists would be out. Um, and she saw them and questions like, wait a minute, this something is going on here. And so the curiosity of that is what really led to like, wow, this is amazing. Um, and so Mana Handmaker and team, um, I worked directly with Mana Handmaker, um, who was also an amazing biologist. And so the big question is, well, how do you miss 20,000 birds? Well, they come, they come in to devote to roost at night. And there aren't that many people out at night <laughs> to vote to see this. So um, I think that's one of the reasons why they were missed. Um, and yeah, it's it was just an amazing discovery. And so the goal of the project when I was there as a field technician, one of the goals as <laughs> while I was there was to catch Wimbrel and fit them with these GPS transmitters. And the reason why is that this would help us understand how they're using the habitat, how much time are they spending at the VO, how strong is their foraging site fidelity, um, and more. 
there's a ton of more questions. Um, and also in the end, uh, one of the most important things is to show the significance of conserving the marshes and the surrounding area. So, you know, it's it's one of those things where if you can really show how important this area is for these birds that have uh, site fidelity, they're coming back in the spring to the same place. Then on their fall migration, they're also doing the same thing. Um, so that stopover, and I'm not sure if everyone here um, knows exactly what uh, stopover and stopover ecology is. It's kind of like, for example, if you're going on a long distance drive and there are no restaurants, there's no bathroom, there's no place to like pull over and take a break, you know, then you're getting in trouble because you're driving and there's nowhere for a break. So in a nutshell, stopovers are important to migratory birds because they need the break. They need to refuel. They need that, you know, I don't want to say McDonald's, <laughs> but you know what I mean, that you need a rest stop. And so you need somewhere to eat and somewhere to be safe and somewhere to, you know, get your resources internally, you know, back up so you can continue your traveling. And so that's why it's really important to conserve areas such as the areas around DeVoe, because these birds and this large amount, 20, 000, about 20,000 birds are going, passing through here twice a year. And so that area needs to have as much resources and as much conservation as possible. So that's why this project is really significant. Um, so here's DeVoe Bank, just a little shot on the ground. Um, it is a seabird sanctuary. Um, it is amazing. There are a lot of birds, <laughs> thousands of birds, not just Wimbrel, but there are brown pelicans, laughing gulls, uh, different shorebirds, lots of willets, oyster catchers. Um, yeah, there are just so many um, shorebirds and seabirds there. There are least terns there. And so I have a recording of what it would sound like so you can get an idea of like if you were on DeVoe Bank, what it could possibly sound like. So turn your volumes up. Laughing gulls are really loud. <laughs> they always dominate the landscape. Well, I should say the soundscape. Okay, so at the start, just to give you like the breakdown of how things kind of went is um, at the start of the season, we had a lot of figuring things out. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize, like as being a biologist, um, there is a lot of other disciplines that you have to mix and match and be creative with. Um, and it's not just about, you know, um, getting the information about the organism that you're studying. It's also about working around things, building stuff. And, you know, sometimes it's electronic, sometimes it's just, you know, it could be woodwork or whatever it may be, but there's always something that you have to kind of get out of your comfort zone as a biologist and then move into a different um, frame of mind. And so we put together um, some waterproofing because being out on, putting equipment out on DeVoe Bank is very tricky. Um, it's, you know, it's the salt life, basically. Everything rusts, everything gets destroyed. We all know this from Florida. Like you go out in the ocean, it's like, Everything is done unless you have it waterproofed and, you know, salt water is like bad for everything practically. So we put together these boxes to um, build our um, tower. So we had to first build these towers and um, we had to waterproof them as well. So that's why we have this here to waterproof our connection. Um, we built this tower and then down here, I don't know if you could see my pointer or not. Then down here, we put all of our equipment, including the battery um, and the data logger, all of them in here um, as a protection from the weather. Um, okay. So this is the vote bank here and we built those two towers. We built two towers. One was placed around about this area, about this location here where it's blue. 
somewhere around here. I don't have the exact GPS coordinates, but it was somewhere around here. And then the other one was on the other side here. And this was decided not by me, but by um, Mana Hammaker, as well as um, Felicia Sanders, that uh, this is kind of like where a lot of times they're roosting. And so the point here of having them on two sides of the island is that when they come in, they have these GPS transmitters on them. And these uh, towers are basically, as the Wimbrels get close for roosting and they're on the on Devo Bank at night, this is where all the data gets collected. And so I spent a lot of time with the team uh, watching Wimbrels coming in at night and predicting where, helping predict where they will land um, to roost for night. And the reason why we're doing that is because we had to understand their behavior. We had to think about where they're going to land in order for us to set up our traps. Um, and that was very tricky um, because predicting where a wimbrel will land for the night is like mind reading to a certain extent. There is a bit of science to it because it has a lot to do with understanding the tides, a lot to do with understanding the wind, and you know, just a lot to do with understanding behavior. And I I personally think that the wimbrel and all birds, they just they all have this sense. So they are always going to be a step or two ahead of us. <laughs> so trapping them got a little bit difficult sometimes, but we did it because we're an amazing team. Um, so once the traps were set, I spent a lot of time waiting and then you wait some more <laughs> and the sun is going down and you're still waiting. You're counting thousands of birds as they come in for night for the night. You are amazed at the thousands of birds coming in because how often, you know, as a person, do you get to see this many birds coming in? Um, and you hope to get at least one. Um, it is extraordinarily difficult to trap them. They are super smart. Um, and so once we did catch, um, we it was basically a race between getting the banding done, all the information that we needed to get, the sunset, because we did work in the evening into the night, and the tides. That was also very important because with all those complicated factors, we're also boating. So we had to also think about that. And when it comes down to doing anything in the field, safety comes first. So when we call, when we, we would catch, this is just kind of like a time lapse of like sometimes this was one of our cooler moments, but also uh, a race. It's showing the race of time. <laughs> so we have our wimbrel and we're collect. We're starting to collect our data, and there's water here because the tide is rising. The tide is rising and we have birds caught and we are still doing, collecting our data. Tide is still rising. And now we are on this mini island, tide is still rising and we need to get this done fast. In the end, this is where, this is what it looked like because the tide just came in and basically swallowed us up. And so in the end, Thankfully, we were a success. Everything was safe. Birds were safe. Everything was great. And what happened is that our boat was kind of like in this direction where I'm doing the pointer. Um, and we had to just kind of wade through the water and then finally get to the boat. Um, it was pretty amazing to be able to get these photos to kind of show like how things quickly change. Um, and so this night, we ended up catching six Wimble. And that was amazing it was amazing like i said when we would catch birds they'd coming in to roost at night so we would end up banding birds in the dark and so on average it would take 25 to 30 30 minutes per bird um, because there are a number of steps that we had to go through and of course as with anything speed and accuracy um were very important and so here's a close-up of one of the wind roll i'm holding the bird and so we collect morphometrics data, blood samples, poop sample, attach a flag and a transmitter, which you can see the transmitter back here. I'm holding on to it here. Um, and last but far from least, making sure that the bird that we just handled is in good condition to be released. So after 
the migration part and getting our transmitters on, like there was a, a, a window that we had to do that part of the project. Then we moved into collecting this. Well, actually this season when I was uh, working there during uh, this time, um, we just started collecting um, foraging data. So it was kind of like a, at a pilot of like trying to test out like the best ways and where to collect this foraging data. Um, in South Carolina, they call it pluff mud. Um, and I was like, definitely, a, definitely scared of this. Um, I did not want to get trapped in this at all. It's like, I know it's completely like imaginary, but it's like this fear that I had, um, that was like, I don't want to get stuck in a marsh. Um, but we had to work around that stuff. Um, and you know, it's once again, it was a waiting game, but when we did find them, we collected the data as far as like how much they were foraging, how many times they were uh, probing and just like what they were doing while they were feeding. And so, yeah, foraging observations in a marsh and like I said, what they were eating, where and how often. Um, so yeah, so this is basically, that was pretty much kind of a summary of um, my time there. It is an ongoing study and there is still lots to learn about it and we need more data to better understand like their stopover ecology and the significance of DeVoe Bank and the surrounding areas. Um, so yeah, it's still in progress. Um, they had one season this year and uh, I'm not sure how many more seasons they're gonna have to collect data. So that is basically my summary for um, the Wimbrel project that I was so fortunate to work on. Next, I'm moving on to me and my new coworker, <laughs> this little buddy here. <laughs> so I couldn't resist putting this photo here. Um, so I was working in uh, New Mexico and in Texas this past winter. Um, and of course we all hear about Roswell. So there were always these alien statues somewhere. So I had to take a photo, I just had to. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go over uh, winter surveys and birding experience in the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, before I get into this, I've been to the Chihuahuan Desert a number of times. Um, I have a love for it out there. It's such a unique, beautiful habitat. It's just, every time I go, it's just something different that's amazing. And I was, it, once again, so fortunate to be able to work on this project. Um, so just as an overview of what this project was. So many grassland uh, birds um, that breed in the coastal plains up here, I mean, in the Great Plains, sorry, um, Great Plains utilize the Chihuahuan Desert down here during their uh, wintering, overwintering. So they're breeding here, they're migrating, and they're just going back and forth along this central here. Um, the project that I was working on initially started, I believe, in 2007, and their first birds that they focused on the species were vesper sparrows, grasshopper sparrows, and baird sparrows. And what they ended up finding is that they were found that grass height has a strong effect on survival. And so the reason why they're trying to figure out what these birds are doing in the winter and what habitats they're using because of the expansive ranches and overgrazing that happens in this area down in Texas, New Mexico, and so forth. They have these expansive ranches and sometimes they are mismanaged. So what they're looking to do is partner with ranchers to better manage their land so it can be both for profitable for the ranchers, but also beneficial for conservation. And so my survey sites, like I mentioned, it were an expansive cattle ranches, uh, I did a lot of surveys on military lands, um, White Sands Missile Range and Fort Bliss, um, and also on Bureau of Land Management lands. And so this is what it pretty much looks like in the winter time. <laughs> it is a dry, and if you think the desert, you think it was hot, no, 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 it was pretty cold. <laughs> so it is a dry, cold, and sometimes very windy environment. So like now in Florida, my work has a lot to do with the wind and the, and you know, how, the, what's the marine forecast and if we're having a thunderstorm or not out there, my primary concern was how windy is it going to get? <laughs> because if it's so windy, like the birds are not moving. Um, and we can't, you just can't survey birds in that condition <laughs> and it would get very windy. 
Um, it was very remote. I spent a lot of time camping in areas just like this. Sometimes it would take three hours for me to get to my, um, my field site, my survey site for that day. Every day I had a different survey, um, survey location. So I did a lot of traveling throughout the Chihuahuan desert. Um, and it, the lowest degrees I camped in was 21 degrees. Um, with the wind chill, I think it was probably about 10. So, and I also did a survey in six degrees with the wind chill. So just to give you an idea of what was going on, um, it's beautifully silent. I mean, you are out there and it is, you know, you can't hear anything. You could just hear your, the, you could just hear like your heartbeat and then like the winds. That's it. It's amazing. Um, but also nerve wracking because you are alone. <laughs> You don't have service, <laughs> cell service. So you really are fending for yourself out there. Uh, of course, we had an emergency locator just in case something happened. Now, of course, I had like, you know, my uh, locator where it's like something happens to me, pressing SOS and like just have to hunker down and wait. Um, yeah, so it was nerve wracking and amazing at the same time. Um, so yeah, before I get into my surveys, a lot of cool experiences where you know, you see signs like warning eagles feeding on the road. I've never seen a sign like that. It was for golden eagles. You know, I was like, man, I hope I see this golden eagle feeding on the road, please. Um, and then sometimes going to my field sites, I'd run into a herd of pronghorn and they like to race your truck. Um, so that was interesting. Um, very cute. Um, and then there are oryx on White Sands Missile Range. Um, I won't get too deep into the history, but they are not native. Um, they were brought here in New Mexico. I don't exactly remember the year, but quite some time ago for hunting. And now they're just out there living wild and people do hunt them. They're very big, um, very hefty um, undulates. Um, the other thing is everything wants to poke you. Everything, everything there is trying to stick you. So <laughs> this is another picture of beautiful landscape, but when you look close, you've got these things all over the place. So a lot of times, part of my getting to field sites, I had to crawl under bob wire, barbed wire. Um, my face did not look this happy after I crawled under a series of barbed wire fences. <laughs> um, but that was just some of the things I had to do to get to my sites because they were so remote. Um, and yeah, crawling under. And just reiterating, everything wants to poke you. So walking into something like this, if you're not looking, you've got like this huge thorn in your foot. Then you've got random bulls on ranches <laughs> and it's just you and the bull sometimes. <laughs> but luckily they've all been very nice. Um, once again, everything wants to poke you. If you can see how large this is in comparison to my finger. And then there's lots of poop out there on the ranches specifically. Um, all right. So basically that was kind of like what some of the things that I had to work around and stuff during the field season. And so like the first week of training, I had to learn a vegetation and the birds by sight and sound during the first week. So it was a very intense study, over 75 species of birds, most of them being cryptic, over 25 species of plants. And so I had to learn it, pick it up really quick. Um, but before we keep going, I want to play a little game and hopefully someone or everyone will participate of let's play find this bird. <laughs> so take a look at this image and see if you can find a bird. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is almost impossible. <laughs> yep. I don't know if I can find it. <laughs> yeah, so this is basically what it was like not all the time, but a lot of the time <laughs> on my surveys. So cryptic grassland species. And as we know, when birds are wintering, they're not singing. They're chip calls or they're silent. So here we go. Horned lark, horned lark, horned lark, horned lark. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, horned lark was one of our target species um, because as I said earlier, it was Vespers, they were focusing before on Vesper Sparrow and um, Baird Sparrow, and now they've expanded the species that they're looking into, which is uh, includes horn lark. And so I got to see amazing sagebrush um, sparrows, a lot of sparrows. I had to learn my sparrows really well. Um, Black Dota Sparrow, which is one of my favorites. I have a short recording I'll play of what that sounds like. 
oops, I did not, let's see. Let me move this over. Here it is. Let me get rid of. Okay, here we go. So I got lucky. Um, Black throated sparrows were pretty vocal, but they were giving chips chip calls. But I got lucky to get this recording towards the end of the season because that's when the breeding season was starting to um, pick up. I worked from December until March, so about about end of February into March. That's when birds started kind of started to kind of start hearing them sing. So Lincoln sparrow, and then Brewer sparrow, which looks very similar to clay colored sparrow, which I got a clay colored sparrow today when I was birding in the morning. Um, <laughs> so, um, but that was always a tough ID because um, they look very similar um, in the field. It can be pretty tough uh, when they're far out. Um, White crowned sparrow and Rufus crowned sparrow, which I actually um, did not see while I was doing my work surveys, but I went out birding on my days off and I actually recorded this before I saw the bird. So, oops, here we go. Here is a Rufus crowned sparrow. Moving on, this was really cool, juncos. So I was able to see a few different subspecies of juncos. So I, for the first time, was able to see um, redback junco, which was really awesome. I was so surprised. I was like, what's that bird with that rust on the back? <laughs> and then it was a junco. And then pink-sided, which was really cool. So that was really, like, that was really exciting to see so many species of, um, subspecies of junco. Um... And we have chipping sparrow and green tail toy, which was always fantastic to see. But on my surveys, fox sparrow, the sooty, um, which was amazing, and vesper sparrow. Um, one thing I did learn about the ID of the vesper sparrow is that very rarely do you get to see it. But I love this image because I was able to capture on the shoulder here. They have this rufous patch that you don't get to see often. And that's kind of one of the clinchers in the ID of the best sparrow. So I thought that that was really like this was an ideal photo to be able to get that little bit. Um, and then meadow larks. This was a lot of fun because there is a Chihuahuan. There's a Chihuahuan meadow lark. There's a Western metal lark, and I don't have a picture of the Eastern metal lark. And so I have all three vocalizations here and <clears throat> really hard to tell from in the distance, but Chihuahuan metal lark are typically overall, just overall paler. <clears throat> and then there's a Western, which is darker. And then you got the yellow that creeps into the mallar. Um, and like I said, I don't have an image of the Eastern. However, vocalizations are very different. So that I usually relied on with meadowlarks to really get the ID down when I did see them on my survey. <clears throat> Here is a uh, Chihuahuan. <laughs> So the Chihuahuan starts to sound like an Eastern metal lark, except for that top piece of the song. Um, that really is different. Um, so here's a Western. <laughs> So it has a very bubbly kind, the way I describe it is like a bubbly song. And then here's Eastern. Here 
we go. Um, another tough bird on surveys were chestnut collared longspur. These birds really behaved like the um, horned larks. I would be five feet from a large group and not see them <laughs> until they flush. And I mean, just amazing crisp, cryptic behavior. Like, yeah. So this was also another tough species on my survey. Um, and then outside of survey birding, but sometimes I had a phenopepla on my um, surveys. I found out, I didn't know this about them, that they um, mimic other birds. I had no clue. Um, so I was lucky enough to get a recording, just a regular recording. It does, I don't think it's mimicking anything, but um, I'll just play a quick recording. How am I doing on time, Blair? You're all good. You still have plenty of time. It's 4.40. Oh, okay, great. Um, okay. So let me play this. Okay. So I really like that call because it just, I don't know, to me, it just sounds so sweet. <laughs> It's just such a delicate little call. Um, this bird here on the left is the female and this one is the male. And I like the female the way it looks just because I like that city gray. Um, but the male is beautiful also because it's just such a shiny looking rich like black. And I thought that was also beautiful. Um, okay. Okay. And also Veridin, that was another species I had on um, my surveys. Um, cute little bird. And Juniper Titmouse, which I really started to fall in love with because they are so tiny. <laughs> they are so, so cute. Um, so yeah, Juniper Titmouse, that was always fun to see. And then of course, this beauty mountain bluebird. I mean, I had the, one of the most ex amazing experiences on one of my surveys. I had a flock of about 11, I believe. And they they just didn't care that I was there. I mean, like this photo is not taken with a huge telephoto lens. Like they were literally just, ah, whatever. We're on this creosote bush. That's the name of this plant that it's on creosote. And they were just like, they were just coming to me. Like I wasn't there and that the flock just moved right on past me. They didn't care how far they were. I mean, it was just such a beautiful moment. And just to be able to see such a beautiful bird so close and for them to not be terrified of me. <laughs> so that was really, really nice. Um, and then um, spotted towhee, which was also a fun bird to see. Um, we have acorn woodpecker, Ladderback woodpecker. Um, those I I had never had an acorn woodpecker on my survey, but I did have a, quite a few ladderbacks. Um, and then woodhouse scrub jay. I have an audio for that one. And scrub jays out there, they are very vocal. That that's a short recording. I mean, I have like five minutes of going back and forth to each other. I mean, they're just so fun to watch. Um, and then I got the nice opportunity to Okay, nice opportunity to see Mexican Jay. So that was really cool. Um, but I actually didn't see Mexican Jay in, um, it was during one of the days that my survey site was on the border of Arizona. So when I was done with my survey, I kind of just drove over um, to Portal in Arizona um, and did a little birding out there. Um, lesser goldfinch, those were always fun to see. Um, says Phoebe, Townsend Solitaire, that was pretty amazing to have on surveys. Um, Gamble's quail, that was always fun. And of course, Greater Roadrunner. So these two roadrunners in particular, I had a really amazing moment watching them um the, basically the male started courting the female and i watched this male first i didn't know the female was there i thought it was just one bird and the male comes out from behind the cacti and he's got a little stick in his bill and i'm like what is this bird doing he's by himself you know and he's like just walking around he's like looking whatever i don't hear any sounds He's just there. 
And next thing you know, this female pops out from cacti in the distance. He runs over to her, presents the stick to her. And right here in this image, this image is basically kind of showing like all the head bopping that was happening, the bending down and the tail flicking. I mean, it was just like, wow, this is amazing. So he really, you know, he presented that stick <laughs> to get his mate's attention. Like It was a regular stick, but he did a great job presenting it. Um, <laughs> um, and so the greater Roadrunner leads me into the next part here. Um, this is an illustration that I did of Greater Roadrunner. And so while I was in, um, while I was working on this project, they asked me um, if I would be interested. Every year they give uh, the ranchers a thank you note for, you know, allowing us to come on their lands to do these surveys. And so part of the thank you note is that they wanted to provide um, they like to provide like some kind of artwork or some kind of extra something. And so they asked me if I wanted to do something, uh, an illustration and, you know, of like, of course, you know, and so I did this greater roadrunner, but this greater roadrunner was inspired by the story that I just, um, that I just, uh, told you. And so it's fully in graphite. Um, so just pencil, um, and I created it on hot press watercolor paper. And it's pretty big. Um, it's about 11 by 14, but as a thank you note, we scanned it and shrunk it down to an eight by 10 kind of card. Um, and I had a few raptors. This was pretty interesting as far as being, um, you know, just being so close and being able to see these raptors was amazing. Um, and I think that's all I have. Oh, actually, I just threw these last two in here. Like I said, I do some illustrations. So these are Bohemian and Cedar Waxwing that I've done before um, and a Graphite Green Heron. Um, and that's all that I have. Oh my gosh, that was so awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm gonna share my screen again really quick. Let's see, here we go. Okay, so. Just a couple of announcements before we get to our Q&A. Um, adults, thank you so much for joining us. Um, our Q&A is just going to be for the young birders, but um, we would love to have you next month. We're going to have an amazing speaker here to talk to us about the Florida Keys Hawk Watch. So thank you for coming, and we'll see you soon. So now, without further ado, we'll move on to our Q&A. Does anybody have any questions for Natasha? If you have any, you can just type your questions right there in the chat box. I'll read them out to her, see what the answers are for them. So, let's see, any questions? I know I have one. Those okay. recordings were so awesome. What do you use to record all those amazing birds that you had out there? Um, so I use a few different things. Um, the ones that you heard were all done on a, I have a Tascam um, recorder, which is a separate recorder, hand recorder. Um, and I have a wild, a mic, a mono mic from Wildtronics with a parabola. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. I also have like other small mics and, um, sometimes very rarely I will record on my phone. Cause I, not that I don't think phone recordings are good is because I don't have a good phone. <laughs> so, okay. gotcha. Um, but I do want to let everyone know if you are interested in recording on your phone, there is an amazing app. Um, by Wildtronics. It's called Song Meter Touch. And it, as it plays, it, as you're recording, um, it shows um, the spectrogram. And so like the other day I was hearing a call and um, I, it was like a little bit in the distance and I wasn't, I was like, hmm, I think I know what it is, but let me just verify with the spectrogram and confirm that it was at least um, flycatcher by, by being able oh, to wow. have that spectrogram visually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, this is definitely it. So I think it's a really great um, app. And if you want, I can send you um, the link to it via email and you can share it widely. Gotcha. Awesome. Because, yeah. yeah, I've been limited, I think, just to um, an app on my phone called Voice Memos or whatever. So I just nope. on there. Song meter, song meter Touch is the app to use. Yeah. It's really nice, I bet, that you can just see the spectrogram. As yeah. Because a yeah, lot of birds, I think that's, that's the way yeah. to identify them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Super cool. Yep. OK. 
let's see. Okay, so we have a question from Will. Um, what was the most unique bird to study in the Chihuahuan Desert? The most unique bird. Um, gosh, uh, I would have to say, I don't have a photo of it, but like seeing a bared sparrow was really like, wow, that's like almost borderline, you know, holy grail of sparrows right there. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like, wow. But I would say my coolest moment was with the Rufus Crown Sparrow, because like I said, I was, I heard the song in the distance, then mm -hmm. it got closer and I recorded it, but I never saw the bird that first day that I, I recorded it. Um, so I went back on my day off to this location. And next thing you know, I saw like four or five of them and I watched them sing and I was like, oh my gosh, that's the recording I made last week. So that was pretty amazing. Awesome. That's so cool. Okay, we got another question. What art medium do you use the most? Um, I use graphite and color pencils the most. Uh, however, I'm starting to dip back into oil pastels. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, I don't do much painting. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, any more questions? Let's see. I know I I wrote down a bunch. I had so many questions. Um, but I'm not gonna do all of them, but um, for those of us that do not know, could you explain what um, site fidelity is? Okay, so site fidelity basically means, you know, you love this restaurant and you don't want to go anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the basic way you could think about it. So, um, you know, we always hear about birds uh, having territories on their breeding grounds, right? So during... I'm not sure about migration, but during, well, yeah, my, some migration and also wintering, they have site fidelity, which is that they know the site on the route and they know that this site has been successful for them before when it comes down to foraging and mm -hmm. safety. Um, so they keep going back to the same site. So gotcha. they, it's like a, it's like a loyalty to the site. Okay, cool. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Do you find that shorebirds show that a little bit more than other birds or? Is it just kind of for all birds? I'm not really sure. Um, I think most birds have some type of sight fidelity. I think like, you know, it's kind of like the Wimbrel thing. Like we don't know everything. We yeah. have a lot of good answers, <laughs> but there are a lot of surprising things out there. And I think that a lot more work well, it is being done. A lot more work is being done in migration. Um, that's really like one of the main things that I love most is migration and wintering because I want to know what restaurant do you want to go to? <laughs> like, where's your site fidelity? <laughs> you know, what's so great about this vegetation that you keep coming back here? Um, so I think that's really interesting, especially because like you, you think about birds, they're traveling so far, like they're they're traveling so far, but they're coming back to this, you know, this is the hot spot. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, I just think that's just amazing. So it, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, we have another question. Besides South Carolina, what are some good places to find Wimbrels, um, specifically in Florida, along the routes? Do you know any good spots to see a Wimbrel? Um, well, not well, actually, I do. So Cedar Key, I've had pretty good luck finding Wimbrel in Cedar Key. Um, and I think, yeah, I can do, or maybe like, you know, doing an eBird search, doing a filter, that would kind of give you a good history of where. Um, that's the nice thing about eBird is that you can put all these filters and you can do like your research and just really find like, oh, Wimbrels are usually found here during this time of the year let me go and check, you know? So I think that's really cool that you could do that. But personally, I've had Wimbrel up here in the Panhandle consistently, and I've had them in Cedar Key. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I didn't know that they could be found on the West Coast. So do those birds, mm -hmm. like, I I don't know if you know this, but do they fly all the way around the peninsula or do they cross over land? So there is, so like where we are in the Panhandle, it's basically, I there is a bit of crossover with migratory pathways, the flyways. There's mm -hmm. a bit of, if you look at the, I wish I had a map to show you, but if you kind of look at the maps, 
there is a bit, we're like in this spot, this weird spot, especially when you go more West, it's kind of now dipping into the other flyway. So I think yeah. that sometimes, you know, birds are sometimes vagrant birds. That's how we have sometimes these rare species or they get blown off course, or there's just this one bird that's like, you know what? I don't want to take this highway. I'm going to take this one. <laughs> you know? So um, I think that in the panhandle, like the, the location of where, like I said, especially West kind of really gives to that opportunity of having a bit more, maybe I'm not a hundred percent sure. Don't quote me on it. <laughs> don't quote me on it, but I'm just putting two and two cool. together based on maps. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Do we have any more questions for Natasha? Just Put them right there in the chat box for us. We'll answer them. And, and while you're waiting for questions, um, just want to mention to the young birders that Natasha is coming to the North Shore Birding Festival, which is the very beginning of December. And she has some special workshops on observing birds and sketching them. And we have a really good Sorry. prize for young birders. And you might want to check out our festival website. Maybe Natasha wants to say something about it. Yeah, so um, I'll be leading a few bird walks. We'll be birding by ear in the early morning because that's like my number way to bird is by ear. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'll be, we'll be birding by ear, but I'll also kind of give people tips on how to become a better birder by ear. Um, and also uh, leading a few other trips, including owling and some others, but also uh leading workshops that are focused on becoming a better birder basically so it's about a little bit about bird and anatomy in a creative way that will help you understand field marks a little better um so and then we have one nature journaling where it's a little bit more free and free but and not so focused on like identification that's awesome Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think to anybody in the meeting, Kathy put the link um, for the North Shore North Shore Birding Festival um, yeah. in the chat. So definitely check that out. It's really awesome. I got to join a trip last year and I loved it. So great birding. Yeah. Let's see, we and, got and young oh, birders, sorry. we're having a big day. Like we're on Saturday, yes. we're going to like do it's like exciting. a big day and try to compete with the adults. So if you want to see a lot of birds. Nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the birding <laughs> up there that time of year is awesome so it should be great we Let's had a see. sage thrasher show up yesterday oh my gosh <laughs> i heard i hope it sticks I around down there. Hope that bird hope that bird sticks around for the young birders that would be really cool let's see okay so someone asked you what's your spark bird and how did you get into birding that's a question that i was dying to know too so I'm glad someone else asked it well you know, I mean, I've been asked that question and, and I, I don't, there was never a time I got into birding. And so what that kind of means is like, I don't remember a time I didn't look at birds. Like yeah. there was never a defining line for me. And so like growing up, um, my dad, he used to be an engineer and he like did a lot of building stuff. So he built like an aviary and he used to breed parakeets and so like he made like a little nest box little plexiglass so I was able to like watch the whole process and what I remember as a kid is like I spent hours watching those birds and to me like I didn't want to watch tv like I did watch tv but I was like I don't I'd, I'd rather watch them I didn't want to read any books that was for sure <laughs> I was like I don't want to read anything I want to look at these birds you know um but I was just really like I was just always very interested in animals in general. And so like on my block, uh, when I would go outside, you know, I was, grew up in New York City, primary bird in front, the easiest bird, house sparrows. And those house sparrows used to fight. I mean, they used to be, they will tear each other to pieces. Like, yes. and you know, they'll be in their dust baths and doing whatever on the street. And like, you get little, like I used to get breadcrumbs and throw it to them and they used to fight over that. And so like, so I just never really had a time that I was like, oh, I want to get into birding. It's just, it was yeah. just kind of always there. And, and yeah, I just never, there was never a, like a defining line of when it happened. It just was always there. Yeah. And I think that's also what's so special about birding is that there's always going to be birds wherever you are, even if it's yeah. a rock pigeon or like yeah. a house sparrow, those are just as interesting as like a Florida scrub jay. I mean, they all, oh, yeah. 
so fun to watch. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's what's cool to me about birding is that I can do it anywhere. Um, yeah. Super cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do we have any more questions? Just put them in the chat box for us. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. anymore <laughs> not seeing any well i have one more question because i know that you talked a bunch about devoe bank um just for anybody that doesn't know where is devoe bank so it's in what they call low country <laughs> I, I don't know exactly what that term means but <laughs> i guess locals call it more low country um and so it's i would say the biggest one of the largest places is Estero Bay is where it's close. It's in the Ace Basin area. And so that's a little bit, I would say like 30 minutes from Charleston, if that kind of gives a better, of course, coastal, but like 30 minutes from Charleston. Gotcha. And it's not open to the public um, no. to see these birds it's now. Not, it's not open to the public. However, there is, um, give me one second, my... Uh, alarm is going off and it's bobo links um sorry <laughs> um, so you can you can go to the bow bank uh there is an ecotourism um pontoon company that partners um and they work really for the most part to my understanding really well with being respectful um to get close and they do actually give kind of like wimbrel tours during the season so okay. you can go you can go out on the boat and they stay a respectable distance from devo bank because you don't need to be on devo bank to see the wimbrel coming in to roost you yeah. can be at kiwa or whatever it may be and just be out there watching because they're flying in and you'll see them um, yeah. but no you can't go on devo bank um because it's a protected sanctuary sanctuary gotcha. mm -hmm. awesome okay well i don't see any more questions well thank you so much natasha this is great i loved hearing about all of your amazing adventures and the really cool birds and yeah, i don't know yeah. maybe maybe we'll have you back to talk just about your art or your recordings or sure, I, mean, sure. I every single part of it was awesome so thank you <laughs> Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to share. And like, you know, if anyone has any questions and they want to email me, feel free to do that. You know, like I'm very open to talking and everything. So like, and I love that you guys, you all have like this group. Um, I wish I had this when I was <laughs> younger, um, even though I probably would have been like, I'm not a birder, even though I did look at birds because <laughs> I didn't know what that was. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, the whole point is like, I'm open to any programming that you'd like me to do. I'm very happy to contribute. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your weekend. Yeah. And then to any young birders that want to stick around, you totally can. You can talk about some birds, but. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Natasha. Okay. Bye. 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 Let's see. That was awesome. That was such a great talk. Let's see. Okay. Pretty much all the young birders left. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Oh, that was so good, though. It was wow. really good. I would love her to come back. Maybe she could talk about her big year or something. She was an excellent speaker. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, and we that would be fun. Yes. Of, uh, young birders. I don't know how many of those people were adults, though. That's the thing. Yeah, I think we had... Let's see. I think maybe we had, we had four other young yeah. birders. Yeah, I know Reagan was there. Jackie. Yes. Jackie was uh, there. A birder I know Will. named Will was there. Yeah. And then and I, Sindhu is who one from the Sarasota area. So gotcha. uh, I don't know how maybe as they come in, once we confirm them, we could ask them to turn their video on and say hello or something. Because otherwise it's a anonymous thing. Yeah. But, I, don't, yeah. I know. I've I turned off the videos just because I don't know when we had that whole thing happen. I just 
felt like it's easier, but it definitely, when you have the videos and the audio off, it kind of takes away some, it makes it all like anonymous basically. And nobody really gets to see each other's faces and talk. It's so tricky. Start. I mean, I noticed on the, the controls of this program, I can lock the meeting mm -hmm. so yes. that no one else could come in like part way in, but a couple of people came in later. So then that would mean you couldn't have people come in later, but yeah. Um, but you can let them in as a host or co-host. You can let them in. Yeah. Right. The best thing though is um, there's a thing 